We all know about aphrodisiacs, right? Food that makes you want to kind of get it on. But what about what's happening at a deeper level? What is going to influence our libido in a positive way? And then also what's going to influence it in a negative way? We have to look hormonally. We have to look at the microbiome. We have to look at all these different pieces. So let's just jump right in. The first one that's really interesting, and I actually didn't really believe this too much at first, but it's the world of nuts, namely hazelnuts and Brazil nuts. Now, when you first look at hazelnuts and Brazil nuts, you think, okay, maybe it's because of the arginine content, right? Arginine is an amino acid that ultimately is a precursor to nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator, and that helps you kind of get the blood moving to you know what, so you can do you know what, right? Okay, so it's interesting. There's a study published in the journal Nutrients, took a look at 83 participants, and they gave them 60 grams of nuts per day for 12 weeks. Very interestingly enough, they did find that sexual desire increased as well as orgasmic function. So they saw this increase in everyone that had the nuts. <laughs> anyway, but they didn't see that it was correlated with the nitric oxide, which is kind of the plot twist. Because we would have thought, okay, maybe the sex drive was just coming from the nitric oxide and more blood flow. What they started to speculate when they didn't see much correlation there is that perhaps even though it's ALA, alpha linoleic acid, and not the best kind of omega-6 fat, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, they did find that maybe it has to do with the reduction in the smaller particle LDL. So maybe a reduction in the LDL cholesterol, the bad form of LDL, not just any LDL, maybe that is improving arterial plaque possibly improving the inflammatory response that's improving sex drive here. So it's a little bit wrap around, but it's kind of interesting that perhaps the mono and polyunsaturated fat in nuts could be beneficial here. I still raise question with it. It's just interesting to look at a decently sized study and see that data there. Then we have to look at another one that I've talked about in other videos. Mushrooms are very powerful when it comes down to anti-aromatase effect. So aromatase is what converts testosterone into estrogen. It's like you can't have too much testosterone because aromatase comes in and converts it to estrogen. And that's definitely going to hurt your sex drive, at least as a male, right? Well, there was a study published in the International Journal of Molecular Science that looked at king trumpet mushrooms and it found that there were 10 polyphenols, 10 compounds in these mushrooms that at least in in vitro studies were very interesting. They found six out of 10 of them had very powerful anti-aromatase effects, meaning they quelled estrogen, they quelled the conversion of testosterone into estrogen. Two of those six compounds were comparable or even more powerful than pharmaceutical grade anti-estrogens or anti-aromatase in this case. That is phenomenal. So what is happening here? I mean, that's in vitro, so we can't say with absolute certainty, but I will say anecdotally, I eat quite a bit of mushrooms and I've noticed that my estradiol levels are relatively low. Maybe it's worth something, right? Then we start getting into a broader scale of things that are interesting. And I am a big microbiome research nerd anyway, because I find it fascinating. We have to remember that there's a correlation between our sex drive, libido, and our mood. So first off, there was a study that was published in the Journal of Medical Internet Research that was done out of China. It was an interesting study. It took a look at 24 people with hyposexual desire disorder. I know it's kind of funny that it actually has a term though, but it's basically like very, very low sex drive. They found that across the board, there was this gut dysbiosis mainly with really high levels of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, which are not bad bacteria. They're actually decently good, but what's going on here is they had a decrease in other bacteria, and this thing was totally cattywampus and out of balance. Now, with this, you draw some connection, but don't understand the full mechanism, which we don't understand a lot of mechanisms with the microbiome. But what else is interesting, we do have to connect some dots and remember that 95% of our serotonin, our feel-good neurotransmitter, is actually created in the gut. There's some speculation as to whether gut serotonin is the same as the same uh, neurotransmitter serotonin in the brain, but long story long, what we know now is that a lot of it is created in the gut. So we do know that there's the vagus nerve, right? And that that directly correlates the health of our gut microbiome to our mental health. And there's a lot of research going on in this world. And if you've ever noticed when you go on vacation and you're relaxed, maybe then you want to kind of get things going a little bit more. But when you're stressed out and you're anxious, you don't, right? It's pretty biologically natural to feel that way. So soluble fiber, things like chia, things like possibly flax, which 
yes, I know, could be estrogenic, but we'll cover that in just a second, might be very intriguing to experiment with this. I've been experimenting with it, and I definitely do notice that my overall mood is better. And generally speaking, when my mood is better, I'm in the mood a little bit more. So that balance of the microbiome is very important. Probiotics could play a role here as well, especially if you're not really paying attention to the type of diet you're eating and kind of getting that whole thing going. I put a link down below for the probiotic that I generally use. In fact, actually, I always use because I don't use a different one. It's called Seed. So that link down below will save you 15% off Seed, which is a symbiotic, has a prebiotic fiber in it and a probiotic. Very interesting stuff. What I like about them is since I'm such a research nerd anyway, and I'm obsessed with this, I like that they put their money where their mouth is with the microbiome research. And now they're actually doing some specific research on the gut brain axis with axial therapeutics, which I find very, very intriguing from a scientific perspective. So that link is down below. You can check them out. I'm not saying it's gonna fix your sexual desire issues, but it's definitely something that's a proactive step in the world of a balanced microbiome. So that link is down below for their cool technology with that capsule inside of a capsule. Now I wanna jump into a couple things that are damaging libido in the short term. Okay, we can get granular with things that might be doing it in the long term, but I think this video would be two days long. Let's talk about shorter term things. But first, let me get some stuff out in the open. Phytoestrogens don't always emulate estrogen the way that people think in the body. Okay, soy is a problem when it's just hyper-modified and has all these issues. I know I'm gonna catch some flack for this, but when you look at like the Okinawans, you look at Japanese cultures, they eat a fair bit of fermented good quality soy, and it actually seems to have a potentially positive impact on their sex hormones, like their dihydroepiandesterone, the DHEA, as they get older. So I don't know, right? I legitimately don't know. It's an interesting piece. So I don't wanna bag on the phytoestrogens too much because there's also evidence with flax that the estrogen, the phytoestrogen in flax is such a weak phytoestrogen, yet it still binds to an estrogen receptor and it actually occupies the estrogen receptor as a weak estrogen and makes it so the more powerful, strong estrogens in our body can't occupy that receptor. So even though it's a bad phytoestrogen, it's weaker than the estrogen that's in our body and it occupies that receptor so the big bad estrogen actually can't. So when you look at it in a weird twisted way, it actually could be beneficial. I'm a big flax guy, so I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Moving into what we know is really interesting, dairy, like milk specifically, can actually quell testosterone levels and increase estrogen levels quite quickly. There's a study that was published in the official journal of the Japan Pediatric Society, and it gave subjects 500 to 600 milliliters of milk, okay? And it found that shortly after consumption, it increased estrone, a type of estrogen, and progesterone in men significantly. There was a 10.3 picogram per milliliter increase in estrone and an 11.8 kilogram per milliliter increase in progesterone. So we're not talking just phytoestrogens. We're talking full-on female hormones in the milk that are translating into the male body. This is not necessarily a good thing. This isn't like a phytoestrogen that's a mimicker. This is a full-blown chemical that has been given to cows more than likely to promote milk production by increasing things like estrogen and progesterone, and that's translating into what is being consumed. This wouldn't be a problem too much if we didn't also notice a subsequent decrease in testosterone of 0.25 nanograms per deciliter, which doesn't sound like much, but considering that it was across the board 120 minutes after dairy consumption, after milk consumption, that's a problem. So is the problem with milk itself? No. The problem is probably with the hormones that are added to milk. I'm a big fan personally of raw milk, getting it from local farms if you're gonna have milk, or raw cream whenever possible, right? That's just how I roll. So that could definitely impact sex drive. Now, another one that people don't wanna hear, but we have to pay attention to it, is caffeine. I'm a big caffeine guy, okay? But I also notice that when my caffeine level increases, my libido decreases. Now, it has to do with cortisol, right? When we have chronically high levels of cortisol, A, we're stressed and we're not in the mood, but if it goes too far, it definitely poses a longer scale issue. There was an interesting study in the journal Psychoneuroendocrinology, 
and it took a look at cortisol levels and it found that all people that had hypo sexual desire disorder, okay, all people, all people that had this issue of super low libido, every single one of them had low levels of AM cortisol and low levels of PM cortisol. But I thought you just said that high cortisol is the problem. Well, when cortisol is chronically elevated, eventually the adrenals don't produce as much. Okay, I don't like the word adrenal fatigue. I seriously don't. I think adrenal fatigue is overused, overmarketed, and in the clinical side, you say adrenal insufficiency. And that is a real thing. But essentially, when you are constantly spiking cortisol, there is some evidence that it might actually affect your natural production of it. But at the very least, it skews when the cortisol releases and your cortisol spikes are not when they should. So basically, you should have a cortisol spike in the morning. If your cortisol is low in the morning, that's actually a problem. And in this particular case, we see these lower levels of cortisol being associated with poor sexual health. So it's very intriguing that caffeine can actually contribute to this. One of the ways that people get around this or they talk about is, you know, say, not having the caffeine until maybe an hour after you wake up or an hour and a half after you wake up. What I personally do, I wake up in the morning, I have some electrolyte packets as one of the first things that I have, along with some apple cider vinegar. That's like my morning ritual that wakes me up. I feel like I get the sodium, which can actually help support adrenal function. And then later on, I have my green tea or my coffee. So I don't get rid of it entirely. I just wait an hour or so after I wake up, which doesn't interfere with the natural cortisol spike as much. So as always, make sure you keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.